Welcome to FPTV New Releases. Uh, it's a privilege today to be joined by two legends of the comic book industry. We have Mr. Neil Vokes, the co-creator of Eagle with Rich Rankin, and the guy who did, who did the art for that awesome uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy adaptation, Life, the Universe <laughs> and Everything. Uh, yep. And uh, we, also, we also have um, two-time Eisner winner, Mr. Mike Barron, the creator of Badger, the creator of Nexus, the man who signed my copy of Nexus 25 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, um, a man who did an incredible indelible run on The Punisher, one of my favorite runs on The Punisher, which is, by the way, Mike, is Garth Ennis's favorite run on The Publisher. On the, on the Publisher. They should make that series. On The Punisher the other day. He, uh, he, he, he loves your run. And, uh, but uh, both of these super talented gentlemen are here to talk to me about the Robotech Archives Masters. They did an amazing run on Robotech uh, for Kamiko back in the day, which our colleagues at Titan Comics are collecting into a beautiful archive edition, which collects issues one through 11 of uh, Robotech the Masters series, uh, with a new foreword from Mike. So guys, how did you get involved in Robotech? Well, I was asked by, Co by Comico, and it was to start uh, adapting Robotech Masters. Uh, and I did that. I got hold of the, v, uh, the videos somehow, the videotapes. I think they may have sent them to me, but I watched every episode and I tried to distill each episode into a comic. Yeah, yeah. I, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I had already known the guys at Comico for a little while. And they had asked me which of the uh, Robotech books I wanted to do. And I picked Masters based on the design of the characters. And again, not knowing anything about the cartoon at all. And uh, I was sent videotapes of the first few episodes. The funny thing was that the ones I was sent were in Japanese. So I had no idea what the characters are saying in, in the this, in this tapes. And I pretty much just went on the visual storytelling. And I, we, uh, in my case, I had to break down uh, into 30 pages that, I guess, 25 minute episode or whatever it was and figure out which of the images were the best. And then Mike would, of course, have to come along and say, well, I, I don't know what they're saying either, but I guess because Neil drew that, that must be what they're doing. So and he would come up with that, whatever dialogue would naturally fit. That, that's the way we seem to be doing it. I mean, how, how do you go about, you know, a world that's as vast and labyrinthine as the Robotech world is? When you, I, I'm assuming that uh, you might, like I said, you might have, you might have either not known about it or been slightly acquainted with it. But when you enter a universe that's that that huge, what's your way in as a creator to go? Okay, this is the story I want to tell. Well, the TV shows themselves, uh, the show has to be entertaining. Uh, if if you had to begin with the very first episode of of any long running series to be able to appreciate the whole series none of these series would last now there are series like that they're limited series that are planned that way like breaking bad but something like robotech which is an ongoing series each and every episode has to present a clear and entertaining story and not leave you confused as to who the characters are so each little tv show is like a world unto itself and you can derive from that enough to tell that episode that part of the story yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> because again, we weren't, I don't know about Mike, but I, I, had, no, I had no knowledge of the cartoon at all. And uh, my, again, my, my interest in uh, Japanese stuff was the, the old TV show, Japan to another point. And uh, so this was totally new to me. And I, again, was literally starting the business. So that was new also. I had never had to do a monthly book before, ever. So uh, all of that piled together, not knowing what the characters are saying, not being familiar with the cartoon, never having done a monthly comic before, I was, I was in the deep end of the pool, but I think that helped me a whole lot. And I had the advantage of working with a, with a seasoned writer at that time, which helped. And I was a fan of his, so. Neil, uh, was I drawing the pages out by hand? I don't know that you, no, I don't think you did that back then. I know when we did a couple of things later, after we got to know each other, you did that. But I think it, because I was following the videos, I think a lot of it had to be That's the visual right. first and then the dialogue That's later. Right. That's yeah. right. When we did art, when we did the personal projects, 
Mike would send me his little sketches, layouts and stuff, and then I would follow that. Yeah, okay, that's that is very interesting. I, I I mean this kind of touches upon a question one of the editors on the, the current Robotech books is asking me it is that there's such a huge difference in the way people research like license created material now because it's all there at your fingertips on your at your fingertips on your laptop right you know and like the you know the internet the world wide web is your friend wikipedia is your friend and you just get so much information back then i'm guessing you guys were old school like smacking through actually watching the episodes is that the way you did i it? i i had actually purchased a bunch of the japanese books that were put out about the original uh, cartoons before they were called uh, Robotech Masters and everything else. And all the books, of course, have this, all this beautiful artwork of the robots and the characters. And I would use that for my basis of, of uh, how to draw these things. Because like you say, if we had had the internet, then I'd had all this wonderful information available, but uh, we couldn't do that back then. So I had to go by the tapes and by the artwork that I had, uh, found in libraries or bookstores or something and i went from that yeah how about yourself mike but now that neil reminds me i recall getting the pages uh, and uh, it was up to me to provide the dialogue which i gleaned from the tv shows uh, which is opposite to the way we usually work which is i write the dialogue first and then the illustrator draws the pages but it was uh the same as working on jade man comics which i did it was my job to give them american friendly scripts and uh they what they did is they prepared english scripts as best they could and they, they were quite hilarious i think the comics may actually have been more entertaining if i hadn't changed the word <laughs> but uh i had the pictures and then i i put the words in afterwards i i remember and people we met that were fans, huge fans of the source material, coming to conventions and the store appearances I started doing them. And aside from the fact they would ask me all these questions, for which I had no answers because I wasn't that familiar myself, they, the, what I had gleaned from all this information was that of the three comics, ours was the least favorite. And I don't think it was because it was so badly done. It was because I think Mike and I were the ones who were least familiar with the source material. And we kind of did our own thing. And surprisingly, they allowed us to do that without us getting into too much trouble. So, but but I'd always get asked, you know, like, how does a Veritech work? And how does this thing? I said, I honestly, I don't know. <laughs> they, send me, they send me the stories, I look at the pictures, and I draw the pictures, and then I move on to the next issue. That's pretty much my job. You know? <laughs> I guess it must be uh, to not be. A massive fan, though, when you're working on a licensed property, that must be quite freeing in a way. Yes, it, yes if, no. if the people that run, are running the license allow you to be free, yes. Because we've both worked on licensed projects through the years. And sometimes they're really strict. And sometimes they kind of let you go. It kind of depends on, on the license, I think. Hmm, that's interesting. So when you look back on your run, uh, are there any particular characters you either liked writing or illustrating that jump out of it when you when you think of it now? I'd have or to take another look, Andrew. <laughs> we'll have to send you a copy of the book, mate. Yeah, yeah. we're looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I I don't know that I had a favorite character. Um, I I'm probably I can remember a little bit more about it. I think than Mike can because again I was constantly working on the visual end of it. I, I liked drawing the, the the characters. I even back then at the beginning, I wasn't that. Even now, I'm not that interested in the tech. You know, I yeah. I didn't get excited about drawing the robots and the jets and all of that stuff. I liked doing characters. To me, it was all about character. To me, the story it was about character. So the way the character looked, or spoke, or moved, is what made it interesting to me. And yeah. I mean this. I, I, there's only so much you can get across with a robot and a jet, you know? It's, yeah. <laughs> so for me, it was like the drawing those three or four main characters and trying to get across on the, on the piece of white paper in front of me, what they were trying to get across in the cartoon. Because you have that main huge difference between a comic book page and a, and a television screen, which is of course, they've got movement and, and lighting and various other things going on, which you have to get across visually on the page. And you can't do every frame 
you know, you've got to have this ring that jumps to another thing. And to me, even talking about it now, I just loved that challenge. Because like I said, uh, Rich and I were hungry back then. We wanted to do comic books. Yeah. So uh, as much work as it was, it was a wonderful uh, uh, tool to teach me how to do comic books. And so though it was very hard at first, because again, not being familiar with it, it was, it was wonderful. And I learned stuff from Mike, the way he would script the things too. And then we started to get to know each other a little and we actually started communicating and such, which made it even better. So yeah. I, at least that's my, kind of my take on it. Yeah, I, I, and, and you know, here you are both talking about it however many years later, do you know what I mean? I'm glad we've been able to uh, reunite you guys for this conversation. Well, you know, we, we, we really don't like each other very much, so we don't talk much anymore. <laughs> And uh, seeing him now and saying, you know, he looks the same and everything, that's a lot of BS, as you probably think. <laughs> because we're both 35 years older since we did that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and me, I got a, I'm my beard's going white. And, you know, it's a little bit more bent over than I used to be 35 years ago. But my, actually, Mike does actually look pretty much the same. <laughs> I don't know what he's taking, but uh, it's great. I, I need to get some of that. I wanted to mention that from what I understand, what they were telling me, is that some of my pencil pages are going to be in there too? Yeah, right on. Yeah, I sent some of the original artwork to them. So yeah, I use that too. Oh yeah, no, it, it's it's going to be uh, it's it's a beautiful edition actually, guys, and uh, I think you're going to be really pleased with it when when you get your copies. Hey, well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this has been FPTV New Releases, and uh, we've been talking about the Robotech Archives Masters Edition that collects issues one to eleven of uh, Neil and Mike's run on Robotech the Masters series. Uh, Mike's written a new uh, foreword for us and you're going to be able to order it, pre-order it from the links attached to this video. Thanks very much guys, it's great to see you both. Likewise. Thank you sir.